Between the time when wargamers played with chainmail and the rise of the wizards of the coast, there was an age of gamers. And unto this, Gygax, destined to bear the crown jewel of TSR upon a troubled brow, to show you all how to roll for initiative. Welcome, everyone, to issue number 70 for the Roll for Initiative podcast, the last episode of the year, 2011. I am DM Vince, along with DM Matt. Hello, everyone. DM Nick. Howdy, howdy, howdy. And the DM Will. Hey there. And we are back with another... Well, this will be a full show this week. No special inserts. Don't worry. We won't rip you guys off with a fake show. Yes, full like, full show. Yeah. <laughs> like we've been doing. So uh, what's everyone up to? I know, Will, you just finished a mo- big move. Yeah, I got, you know, back into the house. Uh, got most of it unpacked. Still got a lot of unpacking to do. And I was just explaining, uh, I think, to Nick and, and Matt there, you know, I moved out of a two-bedroom apartment into a four-bedroom house. I'm still having difficulty finding things, you know, to put. I, I'm, I ran out of room. Oh, jeez. So how I don't know how possible? to. Uh, I, <laughs> believe me, if I should took pictures, you'd be surprised. But uh, no, actually, you know, move with real. Got mostly everything unpacked. And uh, I started gaming also last weekend. So I'm back to gaming again, back on schedule. Very nice. So what have you been up to, Nick? Um, just, you know, getting ready for, for Christmas, you know, decorating my yard. I got like six inflatables up front. Uh, yeah, I got one of the neighbors saying, hey, how you doing, Mr. Griswold? <laughs> and, uh, I'm like, You're like I, I'm like, have you not seen around the neighborhood? I'm like light on the decorations. <laughs> I got somebody up the street here who can like, you know, there's air force planes that are crashing into his house. It's so bright, but uh, (laughs) yeah, getting ready for that, getting the tree this weekend. Haven't done uh, really uh, much, uh, any gaming besides computer gaming on my new computer that I got. Yeah. My wife got me a new computer for Christmas. What kind? I got an HP. It's got a quad core uh amd processor in it it's nice and shiny oh it's nice and shiny <laughs> i love it it's got i got basically and, and dual uh video cards so it's like okay it's got the onboard video that's integrated plus another one on, on top of that and there you can use them simultaneously so yep. i have like 1.5 gigahertz uh, gigabytes of of video memory for just gaming and it's like wicked awesome so well, you don't need that for those DOS games you be playing. But DOS games, oh. are you out of your mind? Oh, <laughs> like, I no, still C colon backslash. Oh, good old games <laughs> is having a huge sale on all the old games right now. Pretty much their entire site's 50% off, so you can pick up Baldur's Gate for 5 bucks, the complete collection. Uh, Planescape for $5. I mean, Got it. Yeah, I, unfortunately, I have most of them too. But if you or if you want to play the old uh, Tex Murphy, Mean Streets, or uh, Space Quest, or Police Quest, I've been playing a lot of Team Fortress Two. Actually, so oh, okay. I love Team Fortress Two. So, anywho, that's all. I'm hoping that we're going to get in a game here before Christmas on our regular group, but don't see it happen. We usually take kind of a hiatus around Christmas and New Year. So, what about you, Vince? How about you? What's been up with you? Uh, I've mostly been just packing away, putting things in boxes, getting ready for the big move over to the big old Texas. That's right. Everything's bigger in Texas. That's right. Get my big steak in Texas. (laughs) (laughs) And I was hoping to uh, get to the chopper now. No, I'm just kidding. Get to the chopper. Get down. (laughs) He has to prepare for the airlift from Pennsylvania to Texas. Oh, yeah, I'm, are you uh, are you driving down or flying or what? Uh, we drove down the first time to scout the area. We're never going to teleport. No, yes, I'm going <laughs> to. Uh, actually, uh, one high of... enough level. He has that spell. Yeah, <laughs> uh, we're actually going to fly. We're having everything shipped. We're not doing the drive thing again. Cause I... Wow, really? Yeah, gonna fly down there. Yeah, wow. I was I was going to kill myself after that three day drive. Jeez. Found the got the fly spell ready to go. That's right. right. But, now, as far as gaming, I've just been doing stuff here and there. I went to the local comic book shop. I played in. Uh, they were actually playing in an exalted game there, which I haven't seen in a while. So, I sat in and played with them. Wow, that's done by White Wolf for all the people out there that don't know that game. 
And that's really it. Matt, what about you? Uh, my gaming group's still on sabbatical, unfortunately. I think we will manage to, this coming Sunday, it, get a game in. Is it a working sabbatical? or? <laughs> oh, well, if between if we have a Sunday night Bears game, our GM is gone because he uh, must watch every Bears game. The, the Bears. The Bears. Then uh, the guy's house we normally play at, first he was on on two weeks for a work trip. Then he went to Hawaii for two weeks. Oh, how could he? I know. We have gaming, damn it. But, I know. So, Bring your friends along to Hawaii. Don't yeah. Worry. Come on. So, yeah, so we've been pretty, lo- not much gaming going on here. I am in the process of uh, reading the new uh, 20th anniversary Grim Tooth Traps. And working hey, on a review for it. I got the whole series. They're awesome. Oh yes, with yes. the uh, they actually added artwork to one of the traps oh. that was supposed to have artwork when it was first printed, but they lost it. Then, over the course of twenty years, when moving, they found the artwork in a desk. So for the twentieth anniversary edition, leave it the flying buffalo. Yes, to, to, to do something like that. Yeah. So they wow, twenty years now. Twenty years. It's been twenty years of grim tooth. Ooh. Wow, that's crazy! I I remember when the first started more than coming 20 out. years of Grim Tooth, tr- uh, wow. Grim Tooth. more like twenty five, thirty years. Let's see. I think no, the first one came out in uh, oh maybe let's see yeah the thirtieth maybe it's the thirtieth anniversary. I think it's more like the thirtieth. Yeah, the thirtieth yeah. because it was eighty one. So it'd be thirty. I'm old and I remember it. them. <laughs> I would have preferred if you just said twenty. Now you went to thirty. Thanks. Yeah, I really sorry. It, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we're, we're some of us are chronologically challenged. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I was a mere three when that book came out, so cut me off. You got whip your oh, get off my lawn <laughs> and get in a damn dungeon. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but they they digitally remastered all the artwork and added some detail where things wasn't clear. It's definitely worth a look. Cool. Yep. Yeah. Oh yes, that's right. Now I was talking about on the forums. I found that um. That module AC3, the uh, 3D module, what was it? Cap- Midnight at Dagger's Alley? No, it was Kidnap of the Princess. Hmm. Oh, I have it written down right here. Let me just look through my notes real quick here. Uh, 3D Dragon Tiles, uh, it was called AC3. It was missing the kidnapping of Princess Arulina. Ar- 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 yeah, A R E Arulina. I don't know, whatever. I bought it at the store. It was like a couple bucks. I bought it for, and I was like, yeah, because all the punch outs were in it. It wasn't punched out at all. It was perfect mm. condition. I got home. It was missing the, the adventure. Don't. <laughs> That's why it's so cheap. So I looked it up on. I looked it up online. And it says it says new price two hundred dollars used one hundred ninety. Oh well. <laughs> so my heart dropped, and I went. Oh. But I went back to the store, and there it was, right on the shelf. And dun, dun, dun. what was lucky about it, the, the shop keeps like, yeah, just take it. Wow. Well, they had no choice but to give it to you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he could have charged extra. Right now, uh, what, there's what, that you, shopkeeper listening, and he's like, I could have sold it for $200. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so now. So are you, you, you going to use it or are you going to sell it? I will sell it if someone wants to buy it. It's a perfect condition. It's, wow! None of the things are punched out. It's a collectible. I, I, without the TSR wrapping on it, we'll say that. Yeah. See, what I do is I shrink wrap that bad boy and then get it get it offloaded on eBay. I saw a couple on eBay and they weren't selling for half the, the price. So, and no one was buying them. Mm-hmm. So I'll just hold on to it as a collectible item unless someone wants to buy it. Well, just like the rule cyclopedia on that one site in the forum that the the one guy you know popped up the link there, and they're selling brand new. You know, rule cyclopedias for two hundred fifty dollars, and I'm thinking like, okay, you keeping that bad boy? Wow, yeah, <laughs> yeah. two hundred fifty clams. Uh, forget yeah. it. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, so uh, that's what we've been up to. So let's head over to. Uh, we have a special thing going on for two thousand. Yeah, I was going to say, don't you have a kind of an announcement to make? Yeah, and uh, what we're going to do for this, since this is the end of two thousand eleven, we have nothing written for two thousand twelve because, well, I'm busy doing stuff and. Nick doesn't do any writing for the show because he's too busy being Nick. Hey, <laughs> I give my input. And uh, Matt does this busy producing the show, so we can't really have him do all the writing. So I've been the writer for the, pretty much the beginning. So what we decided is in 2012 for the first couple of shows, we're going to let you fans write the shows for us. Everyone's written in, and you know you've written in saying, 
why don't you talk about this or why can't you talk about that? And that's the exact voice you call in with. Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, you go to the osrgaming.org forums and under uh, the role for initiative uh, forum, uh, Matt will put up the link in the show notes. It's the contest rules. And basically, we want you to write out the show for us. We listed all the segments that we normally have, like table manners, game mechanics, the creature feature, the dragon sword, the 10 foot pole. And then we gave an example of how a typical bare bones show would be. So all you have to do is pop in the ideas, where it's from, what like from the player's handbook, what page, if it's from the DMG, if it's from a special uh, adventure module that you know of. Because we have the resources, we'll find it, we'll do it, we'll assign the people to the task, and we'll talk about it if we like your notes. If we pick your notes, you'll be announced on the air as this is a show based on this person's design, and uh, they'll be credited for it, and we'll give them a special prize. So far, the special prize is a limited edition Osric Players Digest Size Edition. For f- Ooh. Mm-hmm. Everybody go, woo. Ooh. A couple main <laughs> before it was ripped off the market, <laughs> and you too can have one copy in your hands. Plus, uh, as time gets closer to 2012, there will be some more prizes handed out for first place. That's just one of the prizes for first place. We have a whole bunch of stuff that we have to go through, but I just wanted to give you guys a little teaser of what you might get. So, any comments, guys? Well, if you ever wanted to hear us talk about fourth edition, now is your chance. Wrong, wrong. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. Guess again. What does he want? Uh, yeah. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm putting a stipulation in now. <laughs> it has to pertain to first edition AD and D, please. Thank you very much. Exactly. Any other comments, guys? I like it. I can't wait to see what I've already looked at the forums and uh, already got some pretty good ideas going there. So, yeah, very yep, very cool. Looking, that's awesome. I'm looking forward to getting rid of some old stuff. So we'll get this yeah. out and over people over your your holiday break. You know, uh, if you have one, yeah, got plenty of time to think about it. You have plenty of time. We we won't be starting. We'll be on hiatus after this show when Matt puts it out. So we will probably be out. So January sometime, probably the first or second week, mm. and then we'll be back. Everyone will have the holidays and dance and sing. And we'll be drunk. back, guns blazing. Yep. So uh, we have no sage advice tonight, so we'll head into our first segment of the night of uh, the Table Manners. Yeah, I remember back in the day. A fella knew how to judge a fireball on the fly and how far the cleric could push the undead he turned. I tell you, with all these min-maxers and munchkins, metagame and power game, there's something missing that I'm here to learn you. Now sit down and crack your book while I commence to teach you some. Table manners. Okay, this week on Table Manners, we are going to discuss the bard. And I know that uh, a couple of people in the forum have been asking about the bard. Mm-hmm. So uh, I had to do some research because, one, I was not a really big fan of the bard, you know, back in first edition. So, But the bard made its first appearance in the Strategic Review, Volume 2, Number 1. There was no bard character in the, in the, in the basic game, per se, uh, basic expert and, and so on. So from there on, it went straight to first edition. That's where the bard actually made its, its true appearance. For those that don't know anything about bards, uh, there was a lot of restrictions to the bard. And it's funny during my research that I, I was I was looking at this and in and, and all understanding, this is pretty much is a prestige kit from like, you know, 3.0, 3.5, because you had to meet, you know, some requirements in order to mm-hmm. actually be the class. Yeah, and yeah. I believe the bard is the only one that can do that. So correct me, guys, if I'm wrong. I believe the bard was the only one that could do this. Yeah. Yeah. So first off, let's talk about what the bard is all about. One, you have to be a human or a half elf. I mean, yeah. that right there was restrictive, right? there. humans and half elves only. Right. I didn't understand why they put that restriction on, though. Yeah. And also for the half elf thing, there's another thing I'm sure uh, Will's going to bring up that kind of confused me. But go, yeah. Go. No, no, go. What was that? Please. It's well, it kind of goes into the 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 requirements. 
that oh, you speak of. Yes, here we go. Yeah, that's. I'm glad you brought that up. This is when we talk about the prerequisites to be a boss. Right, right. Strength, you need a 15 or better. Wisdom, you need a 15 or better. Dexterity, you need a 15 or better. Charisma, you need a 15 or better. Yeah, yeah. Intelligence had to be a 12 or better. And constitution, of all things, was a 10 or better. So basically, what, five out of the six ability scores, you have to get those. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, Good luck. <laughs> yeah, when when looking at the prerequisites, I'm like, someone really didn't want anyone ever playing a bard. <laughs> exactly. No. Yeah, that was kind of odd when I looked at that. I said, oh, I mean, there had to be some type of different character generation, or just like you said, the bard was practically almost impossible, which it, it indeed made it one of the most rarest of all character, uh, you know, playable. Right. And he even says at the beginning, this one's an option. That's why it's in the appendix of the book. Right after psionics, ironically enough. Right. That's, so, that's... <laughs> I don't remember the bard class being all that great to begin with, even if you did qualify. It's a hard one to do. Yeah, It right. really is. Yeah. It's hard. Uh, but I'm sorry. Well, go ahead. Continue with your, your no. uh, expose on the bard. <laughs> <laughs> well, to start The off... bard exposed. Exposed. <laughs> <laughs> So in order That's to, why they have to have a high charisma, because they're exposing themselves. Yeah, well, almost to that extent. But let me start this. In order, before the character can be actually called a bard, he has to start off as a fighter. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and, and the thing about the fighter part is he starts off as a first level fighter, and he can go all the way up to eighth. Yeah, oh, was sorry, it like, but before eighth, at, at seventh eight level, level, he has, he has to switch. Oh, just for eighth. Yeah, before eighth, and then he must dual class to a thief. Now I'm saying dual class, but if you play a human, humans do not multi class; they dual class. Right, and this gets into my thing about well, half elves don't dual class. Only there do. you go. It's weird. So I you mean, picked up on that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so the human. Yes, I was qualified. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of weird because then you know with half elves and it's multi classing, but we'll start off with the dual class stuff. So from for a fighter, he goes from first level all the way up to eighth. He has to stop and then he has to become a thief, right. and then he can go all the way up to about the thief to fifth level, but before ninth level. Right. So, so anywhere between, between yeah, nine. Anywhere between five and nine, and then after. He, you know, after the thief, then he dual classes or multi class, and I believe there's three classes involved now. I'm okay. still considered a human bard now, must dual class into a druid. The moment upon first level druid, he is actually officially called a bard. Right. And that's and that's what it is. Now, during my research, I understand now when we're talking about different editions from first edition to second edition to third edition to fourth edition, there were some big differences there on what the bard's background is. So right. with first edition bard, it was more based on a druid perspective background. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I believe in 3.5... It was more based on a thief background and yeah. back and forth edition. It went back into the druid perspective. If you, if you get, I would even argue in second edition, it's, it became more thief like because yeah. they made it a subclass of the thief. Did they not? Yeah, it had. Yeah, I think they did. I have it, to take a look. I yeah. didn't really research too much into it. Yeah, and two e that is beyond the scope of this particular podcast. Right, <laughs> we'll leave that to Thacko's hammer. Yes, that goes yeah, and, and handle that. And, and the thing about it is, they had the handbook for bards, so it, you know it, it, it could it could have varied out. You know, could yeah. have been a I'm pretty sure that when second edition came along, the bard came back as its own class, as a subclass of the thief. Yeah, it was a right. subclass of the thief, and its uh, spells were actually wizard. Right, right, right not right. not exactly. druid. Right, so they they, became, yeah, yeah, they were basically little uh, dabbling prestidigitators. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, this is, like like y'all said, this is a very difficult character class to work on, yeah. you know, because the thing, that you, the thing about the bard is like this, though. How does, what, what is a bard used for? And, you know, the question is, how can I play a bard, you know, better? Well, if my, I'll tell you right now, if I was playing a bard, I would play the bard to be a fighter. So you want to try to obtain the highest level possible of a fighter before you become a thief. Right, right, because right. from then be on, seven, yeah, yeah, because from then on, I think in the rules it says when they go into combat, they fight 
at the highest level they attained as fighter. That is correct. And if they and when they start doing their thieving skills, they go with the highest level they obtained as a thief. Yeah. And then, of course, they have their own spell table as far as the druid spells and all that stuff is right, concerned. Right, right. They're kind of like a Swiss Army knife. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, if but, you want to think about it, they could fight. They could do thieving. They could throw a little spells, you know, whatever, whatever trips your trigger. But it's so yeah. darn hard to, to deal with. I mean, I can't – I don't think I ever known anybody in my playing days who ever played straight through as – trying to become a bard, their character, like, I'm a first-level fighter. Uh, someday I'm going to make eighth level, and then I'm going to dual class over to Thief, and I'm going to make about eighth, ninth level, and then I'm going to... I'm going to become a first-level bard. <laughs> yeah, which is kind of funny how they work this out and everything. So, you know, I mean, but that's one high-powered, you know, first-level character once you become a first-level bard. Well, that's the thing. All, yeah, all their experience, though, from the previous time is, like, is all wiped out. They start at zero again. There you go. And so, like it says, then when it's time for combat, well, uh, I was a, a seventh-level fighter, which grants, I believe it grants the fighter, what, three attacks every two rounds? Am I correct? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, no, they still get to attack as a, as the fighter of that level. Yeah, well, seventh level is why you want to stop at seventh. Well, so you right, get the, right. the three attacks every two you rounds. You get the three for two, yeah. Yeah, but if you stop at six, it's still one attack around. Wait, I just can't imagine. There has to be, like, exact situations otherwise to actually partake of the bard's really cool abilities, you know? I mean... Well, yeah. I mean, like, like for example... I looked at uh, where the, the bard could be found at in other, you know, first edition supplements. And, of course, you can find the bard in The Best of Dragon, Volume 1 and Volume 3. Yep. Drag Magazine number 56, I think, is the most important magazine to get if you really want to play a bard to its full potential. Because it's like three or four articles in there that cover bards. Yeah, and they have that, and they have one of them featured in Best of Dragon, Volume 3, which I have right in front of me here. That's the, one, that's the class version that I use for my game. I don't use the one out of the player's handbook. No? Explain, yeah, what, what did they say about that one in Volume 3? What did well, they cover on This one that? in Investor Dragon Volume 3, and it's one one of those, what, four that were in that issue of Dragon from December of 81, issue 56. Mm-hmm. Okay. And this goes. one is written by Jeffrey Goltz. And right. this one is, it's its own class. Uh, the minimum ability scores are different. Minimum strength of nine, intelligence fifteen, wisdom twelve, con of six, dex of sixteen, charisma fifteen. Still not too bad, but in this one also it says races, human, elven, half elven, could be unlimited level. Halfling right. or dwarves may be up to fifth level, and half orcs and gnomes cannot be bards. Um different alignment than the other bards. I, I could go into to, but the big thing about this one compared to the other one is it's its own class. You start as a first level bard. You don't go there the whole fighter and a thief thing. So, yeah, see, that's good. That's a good option right there for those that want to go straight into being a bard instead of having to go through the whole right. first through eighth level, then, you know, fifth level, ninth level thief, then, you know, going back into druid. Now, you did bring up alignment. First edition yeah. bards, as by the book, they must remain neutral in alignment. And that, of course, includes any of the neutral axis ones like lawful neutral, chaotic neutral, neutral evil, and neutral good. I can't imagine a chaotic neutral bard. It's just <laughs> a neutral evil one to me. I'm looking at it like, are you kidding me? Yeah, I know. Neutral yeah. evil, like, yeah, I don't What know. kind of songs are you singing there? I'm thinking Black Sabbath or something crazy. <laughs> yeah. You're singing <laughs> Death Battle. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, it's it just amazing. Yeah, Eric Neutral will probably be singing something like something from Primus. I don't know. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Crinkle. How are you today? <laughs> oh, I just can't even imagine. But yes, one thing good that we're going back now on their alignment and, you know, their their, their singing ability. Again, I, I, I revert back to Dragon 56 where, you know, there's an article called Songs of Spells. Yeah. And there's some great articles in there, you know, singing a new tune. I believe they covered gypsies in that in that article too as well. You know, well, there's like three, four articles and one of them covered on gypsies, which is like a form of a bard. Yeah. And, and But I think also is to read, oh, what is that question and answer form that they have in there? What was it called again? From the uh, what was it again? From it, the it had, scroll. 
Yeah, what, whatever the one had the questions and, and answer for them. Sage, it was called Sage Advice. Sage Advice. There you go. Yeah, and, oh, <laughs> oh, don't <laughs> start saying Y'all are not bards. Oh, sorry. But, <laughs> not quite that high of a level. Now, but there was a couple interesting questions there. Like, for example, it says you have to be a fighter. So one of the questions was, well, can I be a paladin? Since it says, can I be a fighter? And, of course, the answer is no. You have to be a fighter. You can't be a subclass of fighter when you're pursuing to be a bard. Right. So, I mean, there was a couple questions. There's like four or five, you know, little questions there, but they're really important questions. I thought they were very, you know, pertinent to the case of who wants to be a bard. And they was trying to stretch it, trying to pull more into it because they said, well, this seems kind of boring. But again, like I said, in, in all my years, 10, 11, 12, 13 years, 14 years of playing first edition, you know, d and I have never seen anyone play a bard or, you know, yeah. even try and take the path of a bard. Yeah. And that's why I, I, I like the ideas of those people taking those the options that were offered, like in Best of Dragon or whatever, I mean, it's something a little bit more attainable. But there's right. just so much other stuff about the Bard that, <laughs> in, in retrospect now, is like, wow, if you could play the Bard as first level out of the player's handbook, it's pretty darn powerful because now you have a walking legend lore spell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. For example. I mean, it could, I mean, the bard can identify uh, magical armors, miscellaneous weapons, potions, rings, right on down the list. They have a certain percentage role that they can make. Like, oh, don't need identify anymore. Don't need legend lore or whatever. I mean, there's, <laughs> I mean, there's yeah, one you... good use of of the bard. They can identify uh, most of your magic items within a pretty good, uh, you know pretty good percentage score i mean yep. you get up to about eighth or ninth level you're talking 25 30 percent so you know maybe one out of four times he's gonna identify that magic item it's not too bad and i think that's awesome you know and i believe that the bard alone and you know with its with with its singing ability was truly the only supplemental character class that can complement the party in certain situations right with that bonus that is correct yeah Yep, so this, I mean, like I said, the Bard, good character, class. I, I think it's awesome. I, 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 it's balanced. It takes some time to get to it and everything. It's a yeah. worthwhile endeavor. But truly, this is the first and only character class for first edition, which would can actually be considered a prestige kit or, you know, or a, a, what, what do you call them in second edition? That's what they call them, right? Kits, just kits. Or kits, yeah. just kits. Well, it's a yeah. kit or a prestige kit. Because in order to be a bard, you have to meet certain prerequisites. And, you know, going through all those classes and being a certain level, definitely, you know, qualified yeah. for as such. Uh, I think it's a very hard character to roll up. I mean, if you're rolling 4d6, drop the lowest, not re-rolling ones. This is probably the most difficult character to roll up. I believe a person could be a psionicist or be a psychedelic character before they can become a bard any day. What about a psionicist bard? <laughs> <laughs> Well, now know. you're now now you're just min maxing and munchkin. Right. Munchkin, and all. Right. yeah, there goes the first thing in mind was a munchkin. There's yeah. a munchkin running around. For loose. <laughs> I can, you know, I can picture someone doing that though. It's like I'm just gonna play everything out of the appendix of the player's handbook. <laughs> Sionis bard. I'm gonna blow my freaking DM's mind. <laughs> I will or, sing my song straight into their minds. <laughs> Oh, well, you know, surprisingly, you said that because with these scores, and I believe it's intelligence, charisma, and wisdom that gives you those added bonuses to be, you know, to find out if you're a sonic endowed creature yeah. or a character class. So he definitely would have a better chance of being a sonic endowed character class. But thankfully, it didn't work out like that. So definitely, if if I don't know, like I said, in all my 13, 14 years of first edition D and D, I've never known anyone to actually do a bard. Yeah. Neither have I. No, not and in just... first. Oh. Yeah, not in first edition. Second and edition, that's, that's different. Second edition, sure, because oh, they yeah. made it more accessible. Right. Yeah. But, yeah, in first, I've never seen anyone actually try, even try for it. But uh, if anybody defense? wants to play the bard, if not the one in the player's handbook, you know, do, you know, check out that issue of Dragon that will talked about issue number 56 or at least if you can get a hold of Beth, the best of dragon volume three and it has one of those examples out of there out of that issue and um you know it, it's a nice option it's making the bard a little bit more accessible as far as it, it just easier to become a bard because now you're not 
going through that whole, you know, jumping through hoops. You start out as a bard right off from the get go. So, yeah. Uh, so I don't know who wants it. If you want the challenge, then go ahead and start a first level fighter and work yourself up to seventh and then become a thief. It just and then it's amazing how it works with the armor and then it works yeah. with the combat and it just Well and also now you got a use for all those other magic items in the miscellaneous magic table like drums of panic. Yeah. <laughs> oh exactly. Or yeah. Mahala that actually <laughs> you know, the, the when the bar gets him in his hands, he's like, All right, let's rock the house. Well, see, then you can give him one of those artifacts. What was that big giant organ? Oh, that <laughs> I loved using that organ. I can't remember what it is. I can't remember either right now for the, the top of, you know, top of life. I mean, right? I just can't think right now. I can't think. But I think that's just awesome how that works out. Also, you know, when I brought up that question and answer portion of that Dragon magazine, there was a real interesting question on what about other items that affect, for example, like uh, – you know, like books and tomes and, and, and certain other things that affect certain classes. How will it affect a bard who has levels, who has multi-class or dual class? So there's a lot of interesting questions there, and they answer it to the best of their ability. Some people may like the answer. Some people may not like the answer. But the fact is that once you move on to that next class, there's certain things you can't use anymore. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was yeah. Heward's Mystical Organ. That was what it was. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, and right below that in the artifacts is Horn of Change. <laughs> so, yeah, it was just a thought. You know, I wouldn't want no bard to run into an organ like that. That would be definitely detrimental oh. to the party. I suspect. I don't know. A bard with a horn of blasting would be awesome. Though. Yeah, fifty <laughs> percent greater damage. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, you. You're on my team. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Oh, and, um, one of the things. It's not in the bard as written in the player's handbook, but it's in the bar that was written up for that dragon article. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Horn of Valhalla. Valhalla. Oh, I've heard of the, that. Yeah, which is pretty cool because it summons fighters from Valhalla to fight for you. In the hands of the bard, according to the one article, the, the alternate bard doubles the amount of summoned fighters. Ouch. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Doesn't it summon berserkers, right? Uh, I think it's just fighters. <laughs> okay. That's awesome. Yeah, oh yeah. So But so with all that said and everything, that is the bard in a nutshell. And and like I say, with all other character classes that I have discussed, a character class is only as good as the player who plays it. Yep. <clears throat> Correct. Bless you. Thank you. You think I'm mad. Perhaps I am. What are you a wizard or genius? Darn. A perfectly good brain wasted. Game mechanics. All right, now next here in game mechanics, actually a pretty good uh, segue into this. We're talking about rolling up ability scores for the bard, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, well, yeah. let's talk about how to generate ability scores for characters yeah. in first edition AD and D. And couple, there's a couple places you can look. And right now, I'll just talk about uh, the uh, Dungeon Master's Guide. Uh, where it listed on page 11 and there's base you start off with four different methods of you could generate ability scores for your player characters i found this interesting because at, after reading through again it's funny how sometimes you just like take things for granted or you just forget about them well uh these four different methods are the ones that are recommended for uh for the use in the game and I'm not talking about straight 3D6 right down the line where a lot of, I, I think a lot of people in the old school Renaissance movement just kind of assumed. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, yeah, method one where you roll 4D6 and discard the lowest. And right. they're arranged in order as the player desires. You got method two, 3D6 rolled 12 times and highest six scores are retained. It's almost like method one, just a little more, uh, a little more to it. Method three, here's where it gets really complicated. Mm -hmm. Scores rolled as according to each ability category, strength, intelligent, wisdom, right down the line. 3D6 rolled six times for each ability and take the highest. Mm. And then you have method four. And you have 3D6 rolled to generate six ability scores in order for 12 characters. So those are the four methods out of the player's handbook. And then there's Unearthed Arcana. 
<laughs> method five. Yes, I brought it up because it is a method. I know. Now I want. I, I there's a bit <laughs> of a caveat to this. Okay, method five in the Unearth Arcana is supposed to be used for human characters only. That is correct. So, and there's a chart in near Unearth Arcana, page seventy four, and it says number of dice rolled for each desired class, and it's only for humans, not for half elves, not for gnomes. <laughs> or any other of the demi-human races. <laughs> Still, I think right off the get-go, looking eight dice to s- generate strength for a cavalier is a little bit too much. <laughs> the chances of you getting an 18 are pretty darn high. Mm-hmm. With that being said, like it, it's funny how you, know, you look back and like, oh, hmm, these are the recommended ways. And, and I think... This shows the difference between advanced D and D and regular D and D. Advanced D and D, I think, was a bit more epic and a bit more heroic in its scope. When you're talking about the ability scores, they were higher than average. That you're, I mean, method one. No matter how you look at, it, chances are you're going to get higher than average ability scores. You're going to be more than it's going to be. Chances are nine through twelve. You're going to have more scores above that high end of the bell curve of 9 through 12, which the bell curve is on page 10 <laughs> of yep. the MG. So, you know, we all we all know these different methods that are listed here. Um, the question I put out to you guys, and I'll kind of start this off, is, is there a particular method that you use, your own method of rolling ability scores, or do you use one of these, or you use straight 3D6 right down the line? Me, I use, in my campaign, I use 3D6 reroll ones and twos. That's actually what I use. <laughs> That's what I've been doing, and you generally get scores. Uh, lowest will be nine, but the highest will be 18. It's still not too bad. I mean, you still, I mean, you want to, who really wants to play a character with an ability score of three somewhere? I mean, honestly. Well, I did have a Robotech game where we, uh, we actually used the uh, method two for generating uh, our ability scores. And one of the guys, all of his numbers were great, except one was a three. Oh, really? And what was, what ability? uh, Physical beauty. So, comeliness, it was a oh. dump stat. <laughs> wow, he made baby Jesus cry. <laughs> yeah, we actually even made it into the part of the story where he he was a part of like uh, a spaceship that had crashed, and during the crash, his face was just horribly mangled, and he had to walk around with like an iron mask over oh, it. It was so deformed. Bad. So we, oh, we okay. So, just because you have bad scores, you can make a story of it and have fun with it. So, it's not... It's only... Crippling if you're solely focused on mechanics and not story. Right. Yep, exactly. And I think in, that's the probably one ability where you could probably get away with something like that. Like having like a three for your constitution, um, that's where you're like giving hit points back, I think. Yeah. You know? <laughs> uh, it's like, uh, let's look up constitution in the player's handbook. A three con, yeah. Hit point adjustment, minus two. <laughs> That would stink if you were a magic user with a three con. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Your method of rolling was to roll and re-roll the ones and twos, I believe you said? Yeah, I do 3d6, re-roll ones and twos, and I have them arrange it as they like. What about you, Will? What do you do? Yeah. Uh, if I was playing first edition D&D mm-hmm. you- and I rolled as such, method three is what I would use. That's a good method. Yeah. And let me tell you how I do it. In, in, in the retrospect, this is how I would do it. I would have them give a piece of paper, and then I would have them do is roll 3D6, okay? Mm-hmm. And I'm going to make them do it in six rows of six. There you go. Once they're done, they're going to choose which row they want. And they just uh-huh. go in that order. Strength, intelligence, wisdom, dexterity, con, and charisma. That's what okay. I would do. Oh, I would interesting. use number three. Now, I would also say that if... I was running first edition, and depending on the group, if I could trust if they're experienced players, if if somebody really, really wanted to be a paladin, if someone really, really wanted to be a certain character, I mean, let's just face it, the chance of being a paladin using that system is slim to none, regardless, you use 3D6, it's slim to none. So I'm going to let them use 
the uh, the method in the Unearthed Arcana if they want to be a paladin, a cavalier, or what have you. Yeah, if if they were a human, that's I think that's why Method Five was there in Unearthed Arcana. By chance, do you have the Unearthed Arcana available right now? Yeah, it's right in front of me. What does it say for a bard? Does it have bard in there? Uh, for bard, I don't yes. believe so because bard is right. not its own class. So this is my question then: If someone wanted to do the bard. You see how where I'm coming from now? And you're mm-hmm. Oh, I see. If you wanted what to be the bard do? and use Method 5, oh, yeah, you chances go. are you're going to do it. Yep, because for fighter, under Method 5, number of dice for strength is 9. Right. But this is where it kind of drops off, because what's the minimum ability intelligence for a bard <laughs> is 15, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I believe it was a 12. for. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm the intelli- no, it's 12 or better for the uh, first edition bard. Well, intelligence, you need three dice. <laughs> Wisdom, five dice. Dex, seven dice. Con, eight dice. Charisma, six dice. Comlin is four dice. So it's better in most cases, except you're, it's a straight 3d6 roll for the intelligence, and you're going to have to hope for the best. I would suspect that in a case like this, then, I believe that the DM would have to modify it so that gives a person a better chance of getting those minimum minimum requirement scores for a bar. Just a thought, just a thought, yeah. since we brought yeah. it up. Yeah, okay. I'm surprised they never mentioned that and used that in the Arnold Arcana. I don't know what they was thinking about. What about someone who wants to play a bard? How would this this method of generation, you know, of, of prerequisites, you know, make a difference? And it does. Yeah. What about you, Vince? Do you use a particular method in rolling? Uh, yeah, I'm, honestly, I use the 46 drop, the lowest one. That's usually what I standardly go with. But uh-huh. if I'm lacking players and I really want to play, I had I'm not invented, but I just, on my own thoughts and stuff, I'm sure other people have too, but taking a base 8 and rolling a D10, and that's oh, stat. Okay. Or if Interesting. I, if I want to play a really powered game that I know the players are not going to really survive, say I'm putting them through like a big Ravenloft or, <laughs> or the Tomb of Horrors, for example, I would do I uh, start with ten and roll a D eight. Ah, wow. okay, Ooh. that would make sense. Yeah, if you're going to do something epic that high level and right off the bat. Yeah, but not going to understand that. Not campaign characters. Yeah, but just like a one off. Yeah. Let's do this. One off, let's play this module, and there's only three guys, and we really want to play. All right, everybody starts with an eight, roll D10. Yeah. Okay. I'm sure other people have thought of that, and I didn't think of that, but I've not copied that from anyone, I could tell you. Hmm. No, it's all good. So that's that. Hmm. Yeah, I'm just trying to think if there's any other methods that I know, but that's really interesting. Mm-hmm. I, I just I like the 3D6, we roll ones and twos. Yeah. That's why I'm kind of... but. I kind of like, but it's just like in retrospect now, and like, but to kind of sum all this up, one of the things that I thought about in this, like, and I said this at the beginning, there's this kind of myth amongst the old school Renaissance, the OSR crowd, that's like, it was 3D6 right down the line, you know, that's how we did it. That's how we rolled, man. That's kind of a myth. That only held if you played regular D&D, and even then... Uh, when I played classic, that's how it was. Yeah, when you, you played classic, that's how it was. But when you got to advanced D and D, that's where it diverged. Well, that's because it's tournament rules, and tournament rules needs more options. Well, yeah, if you use, yeah, they were tournament rules. Yeah, oh, I suppose first edition was considered a tournament game. Remember? Uh, well, and that's why it was called advanced. It was supposed to be a tournament-based system for people to play and be all serious about. <laughs> oh, I suppose so. And Classic was meant to be just the game you played at home. And then it Advanced evolved into its own edition and slash game itself. So, But that was the original intention of Advanced. I didn't know that. Yeah, well, all the uh, tournament modules were all first edition. Yeah. yeah. That was the, the intention. Uh, the thing that I wanted to comment real quick, like, was on Matt's comment about, you know, scores and everything. I believe you said something about the, uh, if you wanted to be a heroic campaign. Was that you, Matt, or was that you, Nick? I said, yeah, be, like, more like a heroic campaign. Some of these okay. other methods kind of, like, fit into that. That's what I think so, and that's what all comes down to about on the roller method. I mean, what kind of campaign is it going to be, uh, and what kind of characters? Me, honestly, I feel that characters, are in, 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 the, in the most part are going to be heroic characters so i expect their scores to be more than a, 
you know, more than above average, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15. I think that's where they need to be at. That, that's, yeah. I go system that's going to apply. And just, you know, just to get off just a little bit of the subject on, like when I do my Pathfinder games, I make the, the players roll a, a 4D6, drop the lowest. They're going to roll that 36 times. So you're going to have six rows of six, unlike method three that I use. But here they roll 4D6, drop the lowest. And regardless of that, if, if you, I don't know, I guess it just depends. I mean, it, it, like I said, it's the way the dice work sometimes, I guess. Most of the time I have one person with one 18 at the most. I've never seen a character, you know, have more than one or two 18s at the most using that method. Right. Again, characters are heroic. They're supposed to be. That's why they adventure. Why would a lame old character of three, 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 and all stats, you know, go out and be an adventurer? You know, that make no that's sense. Just, that's a very unlucky day for you, <laughs> yeah. making up those stats, I tell you. But, <laughs> Not it, it, yeah, but there's sometimes, though, I can even think of, like, characters that I played where they had, like, one stat was just, like, really cruddy, like a six. But they were a real fun – they're a real fun character to play because – you. I th- I think some of us, at least I do, mm-hmm. have a tendency to maybe play up that that weak ability mm-hmm. a bit as a good role playing, um, th- th- uh, something good to role play in itself. <laughs> right. Like, how many of us have had played the fighter where they had like an intelligence of five or six, and you play oh, them as the dumb fighter? And right. you know what? It's at times, you know what? It's kind of fun. <laughs> It's kind of fun to play that, like you were talking about, like the uh, Matt that that character from Robotech. Yeah, I think he had where they had the the charisma of three. Yeah. That's a real great role playing uh, uh, situation. Right. There. Well, yeah, they of course. That's the it. that's the right. guy you send in to do all the diplomacy stuff right. and everything. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. We, we oh, even man, had him. As long as his mask is on, we're good. Right. We even <laughs> had him roll his pre injury. Physical beauty and role played out the accident that caused it. Oh boy! Nice. <laughs> so. All right. So let's uh, hear from everybody out there. Uh, what you use for ability score rolls? Do you use? I use three d six right down the line, and that's how we roll. Or <laughs> do you use one of the other various methods listed, or do you use your uh, own method? You can. Uh, you know, get a hold of us on osrgaming.org on the uh, Roll for Initiative forums there. Or um, you can email us, which I try to remember and I don't remember. Come on, Nick. You did great the last three times. I know because I'm looking up on our website. And it should be listed right there. <laughs> ah, uh-huh. RFI staff at gmail.com. Or you could call the hotline. Hotline! 570-865- 4210. The roll for initiative spoilers hotline. Oh, we know how spoilers hotline. <laughs> we'll tell you who the wrestling champ of the week. Oh, sorry. Okay. No, wrong, wrong show. Remember those hotlines, Matt? Oh, <laughs> yes, I remember those. Those, for like a minute, would make so much money. Okay, but tangent I... offside. <laughs> oh, come on. It's a thing of the past. You have to remember paying that. Twenty five cent to hear the wrestling weekly updates. I never called. I wasn't that much of a sucker. Never called one. I called one. Uh, Coach, Coach Curtis's wrestling hotline is the call. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's uh move on to uh creature feature. That is not that is not you can't turn you can't turn you can't turn and with strange ears, even death. I welcome the unwary to the Creature Feature Theater. The Creature Feature Theater of the Week is coming from the Monster Manual 2 from Base 117. Yeah, my accent's all over the place. <laughs> it's the Tahir. That's how I pronounce it. Anyone have a different pronunciation? What? Or is it Tear? Tear? I put Tear. Okay. Well, it could be Tear. Whatever. Yes. Basically, these are cavemen in a nutshell. They live in the cold mountainous regions. They live in caves. The one thing I love about them is they smell so bad. They smell as bad as that guy on the corner that you say sleeping all the time. You have to actually make a save when you go near him. Otherwise, you vomit and become deathly ill from his stank. You're going to stand there yelling at your shoes. And you get penalized for two to five hours because of the stench. 
Two to five hours? Oh my god, you're right. It says that right there. <laughs> oh yeah. With a negative two hit probability and you know, negative one damage because he smells so bad you can't function. He so, smells worse than the monkey house at the zoo. Tell ya. But basically they are just cavemen. They're just dopey guy little filler monsters. I think they could become a nuisance for players if you play them just right oh, in the yeah. DM. You can have these creatures the way they look, they look very threatening, but they're not. They're just neutral monsters looking to hunt food. Well, and they, you are food. <laughs> well, yeah, you could be food to them. Yeah. Yeah. They've tasted the blood of human flesh. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they're just very territorial, and uh, they just kind of want to be left to themselves, and evil adventurers go trouncing through their lands trying to get to their next adventure, and they're just like, why are you here? Throw rocks at their head. Well, here's the thing, though. Don't let them throw spears at you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, plus one to hit, plus three to damage when they hurl spears at you. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you'd Not probably good. rather them hurl spears at you than be next to you, though, <laughs> because of the stench. Yeah. That's true. Uh-huh. I think that one of the only there's very few classes in here that have this, but classes I should monsters that have a three D have a hit dice of three plus something. Yeah, there's not only a, yeah. in this book, but this has a plus six. Yeah, <laughs> what the heck is it? Why a plus six? Because, why not? Well, you know, maybe because they said, well, we don't have a plus six anymore. Right? I, yes, let's do that. Yeah. Why can't, they needed a plus six to stand next to this, the guy on the page next to it. You know, <laughs> yeah. they have a pretty good armor class of four. Right. It needed a, it needed that plus six to stand next to the Tarasque on the next page here. <laughs> yeah. Good point. And it's got a pretty good movement. Movement of 18. That's oh. fast. Yeah. That's fast. Yeah. yeah, it's very quick. Yeah, especially considering that you will encounter them in, like, mountainous regions. Cold mountainous regions. And... I think Matt and I were discussing this not too long ago. Is the tear almost sounds like they took the actual legend of of the actual Sasquatch legend, mm-hmm. yeah, and transported it in the AD and D because uh, I'm kind of a fan of like crypto creatures. I learn a yeah. lot. I you know I think kind of gamers kind of it, this is a skunk ape, skunk ape, yeah. You know, it it's... kind of overlapped there with yeah. you know like the quote unquote real world stuff like cryptids and stuff like that. Yeah. And knowing my Bigfoot lore, if I remember correctly, many people who've encountered like a Bigfoot or something like that, there's like a terrible musky stench yep. around. Yeah. I would so so hard- really think of the tear is almost like a Sasquatch. Yeah. You know it's not really that well, it's only what Six and a half feet tall. Right. So so and- it's not quite Sasquatch size. It's I, I still think of it as more of like a skunk ape. Yeah, like the Florida skunk ape. Yeah, like it's a, that. yeah, it's the Florida skunk ape if you transported it to Alaska. Right. My thing on this this monster here, there's, I mean, just looking at it and everything, definitely it's an organized monster because look how many you can run into at one time, mm-hmm. possibly run to 11 to 30. So definitely it, it fits that caveman profile. But I wouldn't be surprised if this monster is complementing a, a Yeti. Mm-hmm. I was just thinking the same thing, Will. You know, that this this thing here would complement a Yeti really good. And I, I'll tell you how I like this, because one, it said it inhabits the coldest mountain regions. I see two issues. Well, not two issues. I see two things how I can use this monster. One, you can be sent up the mountains to try to acquire some of the secretion. Oh, yeah. yeah. Because as you can see, the secretion aids these creatures to withstand cold, even of the magical sort. This is a creature that, you know, that people can capture and use them to, you know, create certain potions or other types of things to protect them from magical breath weapons or what the case may be. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I also see there that this creature typically collects polished teeth, horns, and crudely sculpted stone idols. Yes. Mm. So this would be another good reason why to go up there and try and hunt these creatures down and everything, because they might have a, a particular tooth you might need for some type of quest right. or some type of idol that they acquired, which you need to, to for whatever reason, purposes. But I love this creature. But like I yeah. said, I would use et- Yetis to complement this creature I, or vice versa. I know. I was thinking the same thing. And it's like I can imagine a couple of Yeti using these guys as like guards mm-hmm. in its lair or – Maybe they just work in conjunction, or we could turn this on its uh, kind of that idea on its ear. Let's say uh, maybe the adventure party encounters these fellows, but somehow they don't get in the combat with them. Maybe the terror are looking for help. Maybe the fight, like I don't know, yeah, or a more has. Ooh, right. Maybe Ooh. they need their help. 
Let's the see. adventuring party's help. They're low. Or something like that. They're very low intelligence, so communication is going to be rough. Right. That's hey, there but, you go. But if you had a bunch of teeth, and, yeah. if you had a bunch of teeth and horns, you could give them the peace offering. They would understand that. There you go. There yeah. you go. Well, would you guys? Would you guys, since it's a low intelligence creature, allow them to communicate in neutral alignment? Well, low intelligence is between five and seven. So we get that fighter that has a six intelligence and let him communicate with them. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> yes, they, they would just be have problems uh, expressing complex ideas, but they could right. give mm-hmm. you the basic, we go over there, smash thing. They can tell you that. As oh, that's what they speak? Yes. <laughs> they get to I the chopper. They, they speak more like, duh, 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 duh. <laughs> Wow. Wow. <laughs> I would expect them almost sound like, you know, out of like Quest for Fire. <laughs> kind of look like Klingons from like. Yeah, you sounded like a Klingon there for a second. Yeah. <laughs> or F- Khan or something. Khan! <laughs> yeah, when, when I first looked at this, I was actually thinking of the uh, apes from the movie Congo. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, did that film. Anyway, Those bad boys were great, so much fun with these creatures if I had a really off day and wanted to be goofy. <laughs> I would change it around so that the stench was an actual attack. So when these things came up, they lift up a leg and they farted, and this would be like their <laughs> stench attack. And like a green oh. mist cloud comes out. Yeah. It's like once every three rounds. It'd be so much fun. And then if or you like get hit with the mist, it sticks with you for like two days straight. So everyone that you come in contact with has to make a save versus stench. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Yeah, wow. the kids would be throwing rocks at you. I'm, I'm going to mod this creature up. This would be an awesome creature to mod up. Nice. Yeah, I don't know uh, where they came up with the creation. I guess they wanted to do something with a gas. There's gas stink too, don't they? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so yeah. they give off a stench attack. But it definitely doesn't last no two to five hours. <laughs> so the Tarrasque... Oh, anyway, sorry, wrong side. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, good monster, though. I think it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Cool. it's a cool little monster that has a lot of possibilities and a lot of things you can do with that you're just going to look and go, meh, a caveman, who cares? But when you think about it, give a couple minutes, you're like, huh, I yeah. could do this, this, and this. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then all, and then I was just looking at this. Okay, you're disoriented and nauseous for two to five hours. Think of where they live. Cold mountain regions. So you're disoriented in co- in the cold in the mountains. Uh, where am I going? Ah! Yes. <laughs> Anybody knows in the cold, dank areas of the mountains like that, any smell or thing like that really just stays right there. Yeah. It does. There's... Look at the defense, though. The special defense, it's immune to cold. Yeah. They run around their undies, and you're in, like, these full wow. things going, I am cold. <laughs> That's just amazing, and, and see, I guess that includes magical sort of cold too, because that's the secretion. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Wow, that's crazy. This could be this could be a quest creature too. Find yeah. the creatures, kill them, get their secretion, and bring it back to the wizard. Yeah, yeah. I would. Yep. Well, all right. Well, tell us what you think out there, folks. Is this boring little creature, or is he a creature of possibility? The tear, or the tear, whatever you want to pronounce it. Fun little creature. RFI staff at gmail.com, and we'll head into our uh, last segment of the night. As the secret portal yields to your efforts, you stand amazed at a vision from the most fevered dreams of avarice. Before you lies the Dragon's Horde. And now we are in the Dragon's Horde. And this time we've got a little shiny jewelry for you in the Dragon's Horde. The Ring shiny. of Elemental Command. So it's actually four different rings, depending on whether it be air, earth, fire, <laughs> fire. or water. <laughs> yes. Earth, wind, and fire. All oh, right, I love that group. <laughs> oh, yes. Is this the Captain Planet rings? Oh, oh if only there was a heart ring. Yeah. If you can find me then a heart I would have ring, to shoot you. <laughs> we could have Captain Planet, and they have to go Captain out and. Captain Planet! <laughs> yes. Captain, Captain Planet, he's, he's our hero. Our... Oh, Gonna no. take pollution down to zero. He's our powers amplified. <laughs> you need a song sung from the 80s or the 90s. Call Matt. He has every lyric in his head. <laughs> yes. Yeah. After that, that's when I stopped like, watching all television, yeah. so I have nothing current. <laughs> 
Matt. Yes. You just disgraced yourself the whole podcast. Let's, let's disgrace Matt a little bit further. Matt, well, how's the song The Silver Spoons go? No, no. <laughs> I was going to go back a little further, like to Electra Woman and Dinah Girl. Oh, oh no, that's yeah. Anyway, Ring of Elemental yes. Command. <laughs> Ring of Elemental Command. It commands me to go back to my DMG, page 129. And yes. these rings uh, give you uh, cont- control over the four different elements, depending on what you get. Um, they they all possess certain properties that are similar. Uh, the first one is elementals of the plane to which the ring is attuned to cannot get within five feet of you. Or attack, or, or attack the wearer, or if the wearer desires, you can try to charm them instead. Yep. Yep. And then if the latter fails, however, the protection is lost. So it's like if you want to charm them, you have there is a risk your charm fails, at which point you lose all your protection. Then creatures other than normal elementals from the plane to which it's attuned to are minus one to their hit to their two hit die, and then the ring. Uh, where it takes damage at minus one for e- each hit die and makes a, uh, applicable saving throws at plus two. All attacks made by the wearer to hit are plus four to hit. And then the wearer does plus six damage. Uh, and it gets better. Yeah. <laughs> and any weapon used by the wearer can hit elemental, yep. even non-magical. Yeah. <laughs> so... Yeah, if you know you're going to a specific plane, you best find one of these rings. You It'll... got a ring of elemental command, and it's the fire one. Let's go to the city of brass. People. Yes, let's have some <laughs> fun. Watch everyone just cower just from your presence, like. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And then you, but there is a catch, because yes. the possessor of the ring, you also have some negatives. If you have the air ring, you're minus two versus fire. Earth minus two versus petrification. Fire minus two versus water or cold. And water is minus two versus lightning or electricity. <laughs> so you get all this cool stuff, but you, they're very situational and you don't want to be wearing it in the raw, against the wrong foes. Then there's also uh, only one power, major or minor of the ring, can be used at a time. And then they each ring has multiple powers. So yeah. your air ring, you get gust of wind, fly, wall of force, control winds, invisibility. And the ring will appear to be nothing other than an invisible ring until certain conditions are met. So it's one of those that a DM can throw in and they won't actually realize just how cool of an item they had until... Right, like you might have to like defeat an air elemental or a djinn. To to reveal the power or something like that, right? So yeah, it's like the the ace in the hole they have that they don't even know. And then yeah. with Earth, unless you have that bard, yeah, you can identify it, and then you know, right? You'd be like, oh no, this is actually a ring, ring of air. Oh damn you, bard! Why did I allow anyone to any of my players to read the appendix? <laughs> See. Yep. Uh, then Earth, you get Stone Tell, Pass Wall, Wall of Stone, Stone to Flesh, Move stone. Earth, and Feather Fall. So, yeah, if you want to go up against the Stone, med- man. Yeah, yeah, man. Stone. Yeah. Totally baked. Yeah. It'd be great for that Medusa Lair, though. You, okay. Yeah, go there. Okay, guys. You're all now flesh again. We're taking out Medusa. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, the yeah. fire one is best. Oh yeah, you get burning hands, pyrotechnics, wall of fire, flame strike, and fire resistance. And then the ring will appear as nothing other than a ring of fire resistance. So the players will be wearing that anyway until they trigger it, and all of a sudden they're just shooting out flames. Yeah. And then our last one is the water, in which you get purify water, create water, water breathing, wall of ice, airy water, lower water. Part water and water walking. And then the ring is will appear to be nothing other than a ring of water walking, which could easily be tossed in someone's pouch until you need to cross a lake. <laughs> you can make this into a totally really cool, like, Infinity Gauntlet type uh, <laughs> artifact. Put them all yeah. there on one gauntlet and make them, like, work and function. Oh, yeah. Think of the possibilities with that item. Right. And then you still have that one extra digit for that heart ring. 
Oh God! Don't, don't, <laughs> no. Summon Captain Planet. <laughs> Captain Planet. <laughs> what about Captain Caveman? What a <laughs> dork. <laughs> when we start discussing magical clubs, we'll talk Captain Caveman. Captain Caveman. Oh, sorry. Yes. Sir John. <laughs> uh, and all these spells, they actually operate at the twelfth level of experience, or the minimum level needed to. To perform the spell. So yeah. all of these spells are going to be rather powerful when you do pull them off. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so and and the powers only take five segments to use. Oh wow. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty fast. I didn't realize that. Yeah. It's the last line in the description. I'll figure because I didn't read the whole entire description when I was reading it. I'm like, oh I remember this. Right. <laughs> yeah. So I, yeah, you were mentioning that you can make each of these like kind of a quest item. Yeah. Right. Hey. You know, you have to find all four rings to maybe unlock something or the, you know, that's oh, Captain Planet. You do Captain <laughs> Planet one more time. I'm going to flame strike you. <laughs> Matt, we need, to, we need to make up that fifth ring. Yes, we do. Oh, we so need so that fifth me. ring right now. So help me. Oh. That's, our, that's our mission before the next show. Right. <laughs> 12. Make up the fifth ring of elemental command so we can have the Captain Planet collection. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Just to annoy Nick, we'll do that. Right. Uh, and I'm sure I disbelieve. I disbelieve. And I'm sure our fans out there will help us along with that as well. Oh, so you're kind of going with that whacked out idea. Maybe there's other types like uh, for the para elemental planes. Smoke. You know? Yeah. Smoke yep. ring. Uh huh. I got it. <laughs> yep. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Rim shot. <laughs> The smoke ring. Smoke ring. <laughs> the ring of ooze, magma, and uh, liquid ring. magma. Ooh. Or the quasi yeah, element rings. Mag- like a, a ring of lightning control. A yeah. ring of semi lightning control? Isn't that one of the quasi elemental planes? Is uh, lightning? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. it is. Yeah, that's what Fiend Folio, right? Oh, yeah, I don't yeah, because that's where yeah, me. yeah, that's where they started introducing like the smoke monster. Well, I remember the para elemental planes are what ooze, smoke, magma, and ice. Yeah, I can't remember. Yeah, I think that's. I don't have a fiend folio with me. Because you have the para elemental princes of evil. Yeah, folio. But uh, yeah. yeah, maybe you have rings for those different planes i don't know you could make something like right. that or but, if you wanted uh, your group to ha- have them reason they have to go to all four planes so that first they have to get the ring go to and go to the plane and accomplish something and then they have to remember don't wear the inappropriate ring in the wrong plane <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know yeah, that's that was- really that's really good idea that's a great idea for a for a campaign yeah, I might actually use that because right. this is a built-in quest item. I can see it. How do the rings look to you guys? Do you picture them just like a regular ring with an inscription on it, like a green lantern ring with like the symbol, the element on it? <laughs> yeah. Well, well, seriously, how do you guys picture that ring in your head? I'm thinking they 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 all look like normal uh, like magic rings. Uh, nothing special because I I think that's part of the. Well, in part of the description, they're just saying it resembles like a ring of fire resistance, a ring of feather fall, right. a ring of invi- el- uh, invisibility. So I think they would just be that hidden uh, item that if you didn't cast Identify or f- find the the rare mythical bar that doesn't right. exist. And maybe once the item is kind of like, well, once you identify the item or somehow reveals itself through the, that special condition... I think some of the things they talk about is like maybe blessing the ring or right. you have to defeat yeah. an elemental of that same element right. or something like yeah. that. Or, maybe or, the ring actually physically transforms into another uh, – into something else. Yeah. Maybe like it turns into like uh, a, a ring that's kind of gold with a reddish tinge Ooh, for right. the fire one. Right. Yeah, yeah see, I like the uh, I like what you know Vince brought up though on those rings though. Yeah, even though it looks like an invisibility ring, I like the fact that if they found the ring, uh, the the ring of water or well the, the ring of you know water control would can have like uh, uh, an aquamarine. Mm-hmm. The uh, ring of fire would be the uh, a fire garnet or something to that effect. I like that right. to give it a clue yeah, to Earth what it would be. What, what, yeah. well, Earth would be probably like. Uh, I would I would think like uh um oh what's 
You not know, not to a... figure something out. Yeah. Knows. Yeah. What 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 I was thinking is you could even the players think they just have some other generic magical ring that as per described, but then they go into that shop to sell off the loot from the last dungeon they raided, and all of a sudden the merchant's like just sees the ring on their hand and is like and just offers them an insane amount of money for what it actually they think it is. Just like just like, and they'll be like, Oh I'll, wow, it's a lottery and then <laughs> Or you're either that or like, wait a minute, why is he offering this so much for this ring? There's more to it. Well, here's an idea that at least to give you the value of these rings, mm -hmm. they are one of the three that are the highest value in the DMG. Right. right. Figure it's, it's up there with multiple wishes and regeneration. 5,000 experience points. Ouch. Yeah. Yeah, nice rings. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. Which ones would you all take? If you had the opportunity to get one of them, which one would you take? Uh, fire. Yeah, probably. Yeah. yeah. For just offensive purposes, fire. But for if I'm just looking to survive, purify water. The water yeah. one. Purify water, yes. create water, water breathing, wall of ice. Great if you're ever trouncing through a desert or feel the need to visit. Go into second edition and visit Alkadim. What what edition? The, you know that that edition that uh, no one actually plays. Oh, that shall not, uh, <laughs> that shall not be acknowledged. You mean? Yes. Oh my, we're gonna get some feedback from Thacko's Hammer on that one. <laughs> I'm sure for long game will come and yell at us for that one again. I play it. Then I'll then I'll have to send him a picture of my first and second edition uh, RPG bookshelves and realize how just how these second edition books overwhelm my first edition books. Yeah. So I say that with love. Oh. <laughs> All right, folks. I guess that's pretty much going to put a wrap on the show for this week, for the last show of 2011 of the Roll for Initiative podcast. And as I look back and reflect upon – no, I'm kidding. Look at Casey Kasem on you there. But uh, <laughs> as, I, as I look, I just – you know, it kind of you know brings a little tear to my eye. That's two years of the show going on. Oh. This this December will mark two years of the show, because 2009 is when, in, uh, well, no November is when I brought the idea up. 2009 is when Jason and I got together and brought the show on the air, mm -hmm. and then we uh, brought Nick in, and we've been that way ever since. And then Jason is now no longer with us for his own reasons, but the show still goes on. Yeah. And with the amount of material that we have and the amount of people listening, we can go on forever and ever and ever yes and ever. Like the Captain Planet. Oh. <laughs> die, die, die. <laughs> so we'll close out the show by saying uh, have a wonderful, happy holidays, happy new year. We'll see you in 2012, and we look forward to seeing all your great ideas in the forums for the 2012 shows. Anyone have anything to say? I'll well, just th want to thank all of our listeners, everybody that gives us feedback. And for as long as I've been doing it, I've been really enjoying the show. It just feels good to give back to the uh, the game and the community that has given me so much over the years. So thanks everyone. Yeah. And we got a good we got a good good crew now, so we're yeah. good to go. Yeah. yeah. So uh, let's keep it original, keep it old school. Good night everybody. Good night everyone. Good night. Good night. Take care. Oh! Combined, I am Captain Planet. Captain Planet, he's a hero. Gonna take pollution down to zero. He's our powers magnified, and he's fighting on the planet side. Captain Planet, he's a hero. Gonna take pollution down to zero. Gonna help him put asunder bad guys who like to. No saving our planet is the thing to do. Looting and polluting is not the way. Hear what Captain Planet has to say. The power is yours.